Yeah, I wish we were just talking about the level of process. I mean, at least that would be progress. I think in, on the basis of the principles involved and the way in which it feels like free speech is already being chilled even before anyone's even filled in that form is pretty um, intense. And in, in the, um, with uh, the view to be giving some concrete examples, there was, for instance policy at the University of Bristol, again this is their free speech policy, where they insist that speakers must avoid needed, needlessly offensive or provocative action or language and instantly out of the gate that seems to be pretty concerning. Another one, University of Warwick external speaker form says your speaker must seek to avoid insulting other faiths or groups, um, which was visited upon the um, ex-Muslim anti-Islamist campaign of Marion Namazi when she was blocked from speaking there in 2015. And then even more worrying is things like the Newcastle's <laughs> Code of Practice and Freedom of Speech said the university will refuse the use of its premises to any organisational individual if the aims and objectives of the organisation or individual are deemed by the university to be incompatible with those of the university. And that could mean more or less anyone, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so it's even before we get to the stage of how extensive are these vetting procedures, how much is being asked for in advance, all of which can be genuinely chilling, the principles um, are not there to begin with. And I think that's something which is extremely concerning. And the reason I'm here today is that we also produce and have produced for the past three years is the free speech university rankings, um, which is a nationwide analysis of campus censorship in both universities and students' unions. Um, so to give you a bit of a sense, we use a um, traffic light grading system, red, amber, through to green, red being institutions which are explicitly prohibiting certain ideas, um, ideologies, speakers, etc., and the fruit of institutions that, according to our judgment, are chilling free speech for excessive regulation, things like saying don't be too offensive, don't be too provocative, policies of that nature, and green being none of the above. And I'm sad to say that the picture over the past three years has been quite bleak and been getting worse. Um, so as our survey came out in February um, this year for 2017, we found that 63.5% of institutions um, are ranked red, meaning they place some explicit prohibitions on certain ideas and speakers. And so one of the big um, growth areas we've seen in relation to universities placing explicit restrictions on certain ideas and ideologies is around the issue of transgenderism. Um, and one of the things that's really concerning is now we're seeing about 34% of universities having explicit prohibitions on what is called transphobic um, speech. And there's even a policy statement at the University of Cardiff on gender reassignment and trans identity, which speaks about incorporating trans equality into the inclusive curriculum agenda, working to ensure that the curriculum reviews are seeking to ensure courses do not rely on or reinforce stereotypical assumptions about trans people and that the course does not contain transphobic material. And now what I find quite interesting is whilst the NUS, for instance, will catch a lot of heat or individual students' union will get a lot of criticism for no platforming who are people who are deemed to be, say, transphobic feminists, people like Jermaine Greer, Julie Bindle, Linda Bellos, we've also heard about, is that on books within university administrations, they already have these kinds of prohibitions finding their way in. And that's one of the things which I think, again, getting towards moving beyond the headlines, is the fact that, yes, those kind of big explosive flashpoint issues do happen and we should log them and we do log them. But what's far more insidious is this building up of the bureaucracy, which even within a university that might want to discuss biology or the nature of gender, etc., is finding those restrictions creep in, and that's something which I think is very concerning. I think the first thing to say is that, of course, sexual harassment is not a free speech issue. The free speech issue is in sexual harassment policies which breach into regulating and restricting speech. And I think that's one thing which both um, <laughs> civil libertarians on both sides of the ponds have been realising in relation to the campus context, is that increasingly it's in within bullying and harassment or within sexual harassment policies in which you're finding instances in which effectively um, speech is being defined as sexual harassment. And just to give you a couple of examples... Fundamentally, it's a problem with broad definitions, right? So, for instance, the NUS's um, definition, which is mirrored by many of its constituent um, unions, refers to things like offensive gestures, offensive sexual noises, offensive jokes, um, which are quite broad on the face of it. And then you see in some more specific examples, for instance, you actually see explicit instances in which that sexual harassment policy is invoked to censor. And I'm not even talking about censoring a particular student who might be going a bit too crazy in the student bar. So, for instance, when the Edinburgh University Students Association um, banned Robin Thicke's Blurred Lines, which was banned by about over 20 universities a few years ago, they explicitly said, their vice president said, um, that this song cannot be played in our venues um, because it um, breaches our sexual harassment policy. In relation to the methodology, so the traffic light system is something that we borrowed with permission and worked from the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, um, which is an organisation in 
in the US, um, which works on free speech issues and also publishes its own annual spotlight on speech codes, they call it. Um, and so we developed that, and effectively it was about having a very simple but nevertheless clear um, set of criteria um, and then applying that across the board. And effectively it's a case of taking the individual policies and the individual what we would call action, so one-off executive decisions, bans, etc., and then um, analysing them on that basis. And so through that, we then look through each policy. For universities, we access them via freedom of information requests. With students' unions, it's everything that they would publicly publish, and then we would also um, get in contact with them as much as possible to produce any further information. And then we would apply this three-step standard, so red, restricting, prohibiting certain ideas and speech, amber, things which are chilling speech through regulation, green, which is effectively none of the above. And then in, on our website and all of our documentation, you can see not only the judgments we have come to in relation to all of those things, but all of the examples are published, if not linked to. And so all of that is entirely transparent along with our methodology, and we've been in constant contact with universities to see if they did have any qualms in relation to that. But it seems, to be honest, a lot of the backlash to it so far has been in principle of us doing it, rather than being the um, intricacies of the methodology itself. Good. I think on this question of the um, on the reason that it might seem as harsh as it is, because there's a lot of disingenuousness in this debate. So Professor Riordan would say, for instance, that they are only restricting speech in the law. One of um, Cardiff's policies operates an outright ban on homophobic propaganda in the forms of written materials, graffiti, songs, or speeches. Now, you are, I'm sure no one in this room would think that that kind of viewpoint is acceptable, they would want to challenge it. But surely university is a space in which someone who wants to give a homophobic speech should be invited and then challenged and then taken to task for their ideas. And there is nothing in the Equality Act which says that there must be an outright ban on all forms of homophobic speech, racist, whatever. There are um, judgments that people have to make in relation to public order, in relation to the potential for um, racial and religious hatred to be stirred up, etc. And that none of that features in the reasons why we marked Cardiff down or any other university. The fact is they're far over overstepping those requirements. I do. Well, I think that fundamentally the problem is really not a technical one or really a legal one. Um, it's a kind of cultural problem, fundamentally. I mean, the law around, say, universities and free speech, there are caveats on it, there are um, equality, duty, things that need to be taken into account, all the rest of it. But they're actually pretty robust. The thing that's striking is the fact that this censorship happens in spite of that. And one of the things which is also bearing in mind the fact that whilst um, there are very um, specific and important problems with universities censoring speech, often preemptively, um, most of this, of course, comes from students' unions, which, of course, will not really be touched by whether it's the suggestions around um, putting pressure on universities to put pressure on students' unions to not know platform people, the rest of it. That's just a bit of a non-starter. And I think, if anything, the way in which potentially laws and more regulations building up in relation to this won't do anything to solve the problem, and it will be fighting kind of one form of a liberalism with another. I think that even though this sounds a little bit pie in the sky, fundamentally it's the fact that within these institutions themselves, free speech is seen as either something as, that needs to be kind of risk, uh, risk assessmented away in every situation, or on the student union side, it's seen as something dangerous and something that can harm people. Students unions are responsible for a huge amount of censorship, the vast majority of the things that you'll see in the newspapers, whether it's the Daily Mail or anywhere else. Um, and this, what's interesting about this is obviously they are private institutions, they are nominally democratic institutions, but if a student union election gets to turn out in the double figures, that's considered a bit of a cracking thing. And so that's one thing that we should always take into account here, is that whilst many policies are formulated, often under the guise that this is all about protecting women, um, gay people, minority groups, they're often speaking on behalf, they're not speaking for those people, they're speaking on their behalf. Mm -hmm. And the amount of students you meet who actually find that pretty patronising is quite high. And I think it also rubs it up against um, one of the fundamental points about free speech and why I think it's progressive value is that's the means through which you isolate, uproot and challenge prejudice. And I think, so first of all I don't think they have the legitimacy to claim they're doing this on behalf of their own community because I think their democratic legitimacy legitimacy is somewhat in question and in recent years they've actually blocked one member one vote moves um, motions at conference etc um, but ultimately I think it doesn't do justice to the reality which is that most students don't want this protection no matter what their background and also they recognise that free speech is how you challenge those ideas the issue with no platform is not only is it banning organisations it's banning organisations outright or individuals outright and I think that becomes a very slippery slope and in many ways actually they restrict various organisations that aren't even prescribed organisations as a matter of law, such as the mm. BNP, as well as Hizbut group groups like this, and I think that's where the danger is, where There's effectively the existence of those ideas, however horrendous we might find them themselves, are seen as an incitement to violence, and I think we need to be very clear in that distinction, because it's in, on that slippery slope that censorship lies at the bottom the, of the, the, 